right, you may be seated. If you want to grab your Bibles and open it up to Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, It's good to see you guys. It's good to hear you guys sing. Did you guys hear yourself? Amazing, amazing, y'all. So uh, as I shared earlier, we have literally four weeks left for this year, and uh, so on, an open door to 2023, and you guys are going to be celebrating that. We're going to be celebrating that. So again, uh, turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. Do you like exams Uh, or tests, right? So many of you guys remember perhaps uh, 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 growing up in in, in, um, elementary school, I remember uh, spelling tests was always on Fridays, right? With vocabulary as well, right? It was always on Fridays there at them. I'm, I'm trying to cram and, you know, you get the assignment ahead of time, obviously, but we don't really study up un, until, what, Wednesday or Thursday to get ready for that exam. And many of you teachers know that, right? You can tell if a student is prepared or not. So the question is, do you like exams or tests, right? Uh, if you're moving on in the grade levels, you'll know that you'll have final examinations in your middle school and definitely high school, right? Uh, and if you're, a, if you're a teenager uh, at 15, you, 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 you start uh, driver school and eventually you have to go to the DMV and have your final driver's examination, right? Where, where the instructor says, you know, here's a coffee and if this spills, you fail. Now I'm just kidding, right? So, so anyway, so if you remember that first time in your, your, at age 16, you get your examination, right, your driver's exam, and then after that you, you pass and all your friends are super happy because they, you get to take, drive them around all over the place. So thereafter, as you graduate from high school, you remember taking this exam called the SATs, right? Many of you guys it's a, it, uh, remember those, uh, uh, that examination, and to get a perfect score for an SAT is 1,600. Joy and I actually grew, uh, knew somebody in our, our church who got a perfect 1,600. Homeschool, <laughs> perfect 1,600 in, the, in his SATs, right? And then if you, if you go on into, into college, you remember those final exams, and after you graduate right from college, you, you, if you are a specific trade or anything like that, if you're a teacher, you have to take this teacher certification exam, right? Okay. If you are in the, in, in the trade of uh, being an electrician, you have to take your journeyman's examination or a mechanic, right? There's all these different exams. And if you wanted to go to law school, you have to take this examination called the LSAT, right, to get into law school. If you want to go into medical school, you have to take an exam called the MCAT, right? If you want to go to graduate school, you have to take this exam called the GRE, right? So on and on and on. But today, I'm talking about an exam, a test that is not of academic achievement. It's, not a te- it's a test that's not about getting into a program or receiving a specific training or a specific trade, but it's greater than all those combined. It's a test that God imposes to determine if your heart is really for Him. Only this time we must pass the examination. For some, it may be a small test, small little steps. For some of us, it will be big tests. For some, that it will cost not as great, but for others, it is much. Today, we're going to talk about the tests that are one of our great patriarchs, Abraham, a test of faith. It's a test above all the other tests. You see, we've been going through some weeks now of our Faith Bridge series, and God uses, right, God uses in Hebrews chapter 11, ordinary men, right, ordinary men to show his strength of his power and his promises. Ordinary men that he's going to use to get us from place A to place B, and it's all in the undercurrent of faith. 
Now, as you guys see, these men that we've been going and talking about, these men were not perfect men, right? Some of them doubted, some of them struggled, some of them even laughed of what God is going to do. That's what we're going to talk about today. So the Faith Bridge series, God is going to use ordinary men of the Bible and illustrate that by faith, God is going to fulfill his purpose by using these ordinary men. Ordinary men like you and I today, right? So if you want to stand up, we're going to read Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17. All right, let's all stand up in reverence of God's words. It says here, By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. Circle that. For it was he to whom it was said, In Isaac, your descendants shall be called. You may be seated. Just two short verses. So let me just do a little recap for us today. It might be some time since you read the book of Genesis where we have the story of Abraham and his son Isaac. But see, God calls him, Abraham, right, in Genesis chapter 12, into a uh, to go from one place to the other, to a foreign land, away from the creature comforts, away from protection, away from his kin, to a land he was going to show him. Even more, he was going to bless him with not only land, but bless him with a seed, a seed that would go on from generation to generation, and he's going to bless him and surely bless him. But the problem is Abraham was, what, 75 years old. And his wife Sarah was also old. It was this time that this time where they couldn't go to an OBGN doctor to see that doctor. They couldn't go to a urologist. They couldn't see a fertility specialist. Right? They only had one thing to go by. God's promise. God's promise. So Sarah, what what happens? We'll see here. Sarah gets impatient. Right? So God prophesied that this was going to happen. Sarah gets impatient. She says, you know what, Abraham, you know, you know, here's, I have a maid right here, okay? Go into her, perhaps I can help speed this process along, right? Don't we, are we ever in that situation where God puts it in your heart to be able to do something for him? But it's just taken a long time. So he says, hey, I'm going to do you a favor, God. <laughs> I'm going to help you out. But when that happens, when we decide to help God out, or see, God doesn't need your help. He doesn't need my help. He's totally autonomous. He can make any decisions. He's just. He's never changing. So when he says he's going to do such, he's going to fulfill. But the question is, are you with it? Our, the question is, are we with it? Are we going to be patient as he refines us into this process? So finally, what happened was at because of this, Abraham has a son named Ishmael at age 86, okay? Imagine this. Raise your hands if you are age 86 or greater. Okay, imagine having a son at this age. <laughs> well, what we can do is we can tune them out now. We can't hear anything. We just tune out our, our hearing aids, right? Okay, right? But, but imagine this. At age 86, okay, you don't have any help. You're in a foreign land, okay? You don't have your kin to protect you, right? You just can't, you're going by faith and faith alone and God's promises. And God says, you're going to have a child. You're like, what? At age 86? It would be one thing if you're 26, but age 86? Really? You're down to going to bed at 6, what, 6, 7, 30 p.m. As I'm getting older, that's what I'm doing, right? I'm going to bed earlier. So imagine this what he's going to do. But there's, there's a situation also is that Ishmael was going to live at odds with his brothers. But he was going to be a hunter, an outdoorsman, right? He, he knew how to hunt. He was a nomad. But finally, at age 99, God says in Genesis 17, I'm going to fulfill this promise I have for you, Abraham. I'm going to give you land surely seeds and blessings and this is where we find sarai at that time 
who laughed at God. Actually, there's an exchange in this chapter where there's a dialogue where Sarah laughed and God says, no, I'm going to fulfill it. And then, and then Sarah says, lies, and says, no, I didn't laugh. And God said, yes, you did laugh. So it's a funny exchange. So God promised Abraham's son at age uh, beforehand, and then at, 90, at, at 100 years old, God gives him his son. The impossible becomes possible in God. So just let that sink in. We're in a world where things are rapidly changing. People have so much control. They're, they tell you what to do. They tell you this and that. But God is totally autonomous over man's laws and man's ways. So we have to think of this supernatural because that comes into faith, right? Because faith is what? Faith, if, if, if it wasn't for faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder for those that seek him. So let me just, if you don't understand one, if you don't get anything, get this one thing today from me, is that with God, all things are possible. And we're going to celebrate that in this coming month, this month alone, as we celebrate Christ's birth, the greatest gift ever to mankind from God. So a little more context into this in Genesis 22, this is where the test begins. You see, something we have to realize is that God tests us all the time. Some might be a little test, some may be big tests. But in, in addition to that, God is going to do that, to test if our heart is truly, truly aligned with Him. Notice this test, it's not about perfection. Because surely Abraham had many faults, his wife had many faults, right? But God was still going to use him. Because God is always faithful in his promises. So Genesis 20, uh, 22, this is the test. Let me just read it in context for us to remember what he's talking about here. It says here in verse 1, Genesis 22. Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham. So it's not an if. He tested him. It was very clear here. And said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And he said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering to one of the mountains, which I will tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering and rose and went to the place which God was, had told him. Now on the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. Abraham said to the young men, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go over there, and we will worship and return to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his, uh, Isaac his son, and he took in his hand the fire and a knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for which the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Then they came to a place which God had told them, and Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son, but the angel of the Lord called him from heaven and said to Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him, for now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Fast forward, verse 15. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I sworn and declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and not withheld your son, your only son. Indeed, 
I will greatly bless you. I will greatly multiply your seeds as the stars of the heavens, as the sand which you are on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies, and your seed, all the nations on the earth, shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. This is a test. This is the ultimate test. Imagine this. One that has been promised to you, this one son. And that is what God says to sacrifice to the Lord. Can you do that? Now, some of you parents says, hey, you know what? I got a quite, quite a few of those kids. Yeah, sure, right? I'm just kidding, all right? I'm kidding. But to the one that you love, your only son, that is the true test. Now you're probably thinking, okay, Pastor, it's 2023. That would be murder, just FYI. Yeah, it would be murder. But the, the message is the same. Do you trust God that God will provide and that God requires your very best to give to Him? Your very best. You know, many of us, uh, Joy and I grew up in, in Florida, and we live in a beach community, <laughs> right? Our first home that we could afford was probably walking distance to the beach. Great community, small house. But one thing that really dis irks me is when we go to church, we have people that come in, first of all, they come late. Okay, I'm not trying to be a legalist. I'm just make, making points, so go along with me here. And they come in their comfort, their flip-flops, their, um, their shorts, and it's kind of this lackadaisy gift that I give to, to, to the Lord one time a week for one and a half hour. And they come in late. And they come in, and I've, I've heard my pastor tell me about this. That irritates him when they come in late, and they walk around saying hi to their friends in the middle of the sermon with their coffee cup and their shorts and their flip-flops, kind of just lacks a daisy. Is that what God gives? What, is that what God requires of giving your very best? I think not. So think about this. The ultimate test. How did Abraham do this? Really, I, that, that's a question for me. How did he have this giant faith, knowing that what he had to give up because he truly believed that God is enduring in his promises. Well, I want to share that with you sometime today. The fact is for some, we've already been living your life in faith. You're here because purely by faith. But for others, we're barely even noticing God's movement in our lives. We're just going as we go. So, I, so, so the two, two groups here that I want to mention, but I think these three points is going to challenge us. Whatever camp you're in, wherever you are, whether you're sensing God's movement on an everyday basis, God bless you, or whether, whether you're going just by, motion, by the motions of it all. Maybe you're in between. But I have three things that I want to share with you that we all must adhere to. Number one, godly preparation is primary. Godly preparation is primary. In other words, are you prepared? Are you prepared? Let me give you an illustration here is that this has statistically been proven that those who sit in front of class, and many of you teachers here, many of those that sit in front of the class voluntarily, <laughs> right, gets one grade higher than those that sit in the back. Why? It's because they're prepared. They're ready. They have their notebook out. They have their pens. They're ready to take notes. Their heart is ready. They're prepared. They slept through the night well, right? They went to bed early. They got up early in anticipation of what the teacher is going to teach, right? This preparation, are we prepared to hear from God? And again, you can be in that camp where you're hearing from God, you're having your, your, your daily devotions consistently year, year after year and after year. 
and for those that are just barely making it, right? And we all know we have seasons in life. This is not to place judgment on you. Only you and God knows that, right? God knows that about you. But wherever you are, I believe this is still very applicable for us to prepare. Are you prepared? You see, going to church, making a decision to go to church, it doesn't happen Sunday morning. It happens Saturday and all week. Are you ready? Are you ready to hear from God's Word? Is your heart cultivated? Is it going to fall in good soil? Or is it going to fall where there are rocks? Where Satan robs away the Word of God? Similarly, football, right? If you guys enjoy college football or, or NFL or any of these sports, do you know that these coaches prepare in advance? They don't just prepare the day of the game. They prepare and they watch film. They look at plays. They look at statistics. They see, okay, this this quarterback throws more 90% on this side of the field. So do we need to put more people in that area to cover, have band coverage or zone coverage? They study this ahead of time. That's what the difference is between those that enter the playoffs and those that actually win the Super Bowl. Are you prepared in such? See, Abraham prepared many days in advance. Abraham prepared many weeks in advance. Abraham prepared many years in advance. Because it says here, the lad, okay? So this is not like a one-year-old child, a two-year-old child. This is a a lad that can carry firewood, strong enough to hike days upon days into the wilderness. So he has prepared for this. See, he knew that the Lord giveth and the Lord takes it away. Notice there was no hesitation. There was no conversation as in previous texts between God and Sarah and Abraham having conversation There's no, let's, hey, time out, God. Are you sure about this? There's no, let's talk about this and have prayer about this. He was prepared days in advance. He was prepared weeks in advance. He was prepared years in advance. I think we have a lot to learn from Abraham. Now, I want to give you some tidbits on steps to prepare. Number one, Is your heart prepared for it by prayer? And we live in an age where prayer, what, really? I don't believe in prayer anymore. I do. Because prayer starts everything. Prayer is that little fire that may, may spark. And once it spreads, it's ready and it can cultivate, it can change. It can change trajectories of nations. You want your nation to be changed? You pray. You want your nation, you want want us to be in the right path? You pray. Do you pray for our president? Do you pray for Congress? Do you pray for our governors? State representatives? Do you pray for your local group of people, leaders in your community? Or are we quick to Facebook and say, I don't like this person, I don't like this? You know, perhaps where we are in the predicament where we are is we spend more time bashing than praying. So let me just challenge you that. Do you have the heart of prayer? Number two, do you have a heart to be able to spend time in God's words? Are you, are you daily seeking God's words? And many of you guys have. God bless you. We want to hear that. But I could surely tell you that the world, the Christian nation that we are supposedly called, do not spend. They spend more time on Facebook and other social media than God's words. Even if you cut your time in those entertainment, I could tell you, you're going to gain a lot from God's words. Because God's words never change. And it's always stand strong. Number three, do you have the heart to fellowship at church? You know, long are the days where we can watch film, we can watch 
Facebook, we can watch YouTube, but are you really in the church? And when you're at the church, do you have the heart to be at the church? Does that make sense? So it's not where you're at, it's your heart of the matter. Are you ready to receive what is going to be shared on Sundays? Are you ready to cultivate your heart, to be challenged? Are you there jotting down notes on your Bible? Because the more notes you take, it's not just for you to remember, it's for you to recall and for you to know that if you don't review your notes the night after, the same day, you chances are you'll forget what the message is. Do you have the heart of fellowship? And I'm talking about fellowship. It's not just like, hey, you know, we're going to pray for food and that's it. I'm going to talk about, hey, how is it going? No, I'm not talking about that fellowship. I'm talking about New Testament early church fellowship where they broke bread and they talked about life. They talked about struggles. They talked about persecution. They talked about not having medication. They talked about death or the or the very doors of death. And number five, do you have the heart to practice what you're hearing? You know, we, 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 we're in a nation where we have more Bibles than any other generation before. <laughs> more Bibles. Probably have ten, five, bi- uh, ten Bibles at your, your house. Don't quote me on that, but we have an, a sure amount. Do we actually read it? Do we practice what we hear? Right? So I want to just challenge you in these areas. Preparation is primary. Preparation is primary. Number two, the heart matters. The heart matters. Let me share with you an illustration. Many of you guys probably had and watched these horse race, right? Right? These 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 horses that run this, they 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 run and the gate opens and Etc. They run through, and whoever finishes last wins, correct? But do you guys know that half of the journey of this horse running this lap, half of it, they run out of breath. These horses run out of breath halfway through. So what gets them going? What, 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 what's the difference between a loser and a winner? Is that winning horse runs by heart. They can't breathe. Because they run to their, they're their out of breath. That's what makes these horses win. It's purely heart. So my question for you, church, is, do you have the heart to win? Do you have the heart to win knowing that God oversees everything? He knows every single detail about your life and my life. He knows when he's going to test us to surely, sure, point our genuinity, our allegiance in Christ, right? So where is your heart today, Christian? Is your heart your worries? Is your heart based on materialism? Is your heart based on status? Is your heart living in the glory days? Oh, yeah, I used to do this before and all these things. Is your heart there? Those who are great, I'm not discounting those things. I'm not discounting our worries. I'm not get discounting those things. But our, is your, where is your heart today? See, one thing we know is that Christ, he, he keeps his promises. So when he surely says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. We have to understand that. We have to take away those things, those peripheral things, and be laser-focused in the faith and promises that he gives. Let me just share with you where there is a lack of heart. This, is, this came out this week from many news articles. One I'm quoting from, from are, is from the Associated Press, which says this, I quote, Fewer than half the people in England and Wales consider themselves Christians according to the most recent census. The first time a minority of population has followed the country's official religion. Britain has become less religious, less white in the decades since the last census. 
Figures from 2021 census released Tuesday by the Office of National Statistics revealed some 46.2% of the population in England and Wales described themselves as Christians on the day of 2021 census, down from 58, I'm sorry, 59.3% a day, decade earlier. The Muslim population grew from 4.9% to 6.5% of the total, while 1.5% identified as Hindu, up from 1.5%. More than one in three people, 37%, said they had no religion, up from 25% in 2011. Times are drastically changing. Where's your heart? Culture is changing. Technology is changing. Laws are changing. Where's your heart? You see, your heart is what is going to endure that test. I'm going to share with you, as heart matters most, I had a privilege to be able to, um, to be included in our SBTC Regenesis program for our church. And what does that mean? I'm getting eyes like, eh, what? All right, hold on. So this is a refocus on what church and how we can best reach our community. I don't know too much more about it. I'm still waiting for, for once. But once I hear from them in January, I will be assigned as your pastor on a cohort of other pastors in the state of Texas. Why? And that's how do we refocus in reaching our community. Okay? I don't have any more information. Don't ask me. <laughs> I'll tell you as it goes. But I'm excited about it. Because guess what? Whenever we hear from others that want to pour in to get us to be in a healthier state so that we can reach our purpose and our potential in our community, I'm all for it, right? I'm all for it, and you should be too. So be praying that for me. Number three. Okay, I've got a few more minutes. Number three. It's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you something. This is no fine print. God says in himself, it will cost you. There's an upfront cost, but the back end you will reap exponentially. That is the hope that we have. You see, Abraham was going to be a father of nations. His descendants will outnumber the sands of the sea. A birth of a nation, 12 tribes of Israel. Upfront costs, back end exponential promises. What am I saying? Sometimes the test is so enduring. Sometimes the test is so nerve-wracking. Sometimes the test is so discouraging. There's just no way. But if you look forward of what God is going to do, it's going to get you through. It's going to get me through. It's going to get us as a Christian nation, hopefully, to get through. But it all starts with the cost. It's a cost. Now, you, you guys know in a few weeks, you'll have this Christmas season that we're celebrating where you have relatives galore. You'll have friends that you've, seen, you've not seen for years, relatives you've not seen for years, yes. And you can be used by God's glory, right, to share the good news. There is a cost. They might not invite you next year. <laughs> You're like, okay, good. Or you might not invite them. I'm just kidding. There's always a cost, but let me just tell you, the end result is so much greater. Sometimes we get so tunnel vision, we think of all the barriers and the obstacles we have to face, knowing that the battle has already been won. You see, that, that's what Satan will do. Satan will lie, he will discourage you, he will isolate you, he will do anything he will to to, to tell yourself stories, oh yeah, they don't want me, they don't like me, they don't, I'm not going to show up because of this. No, that's a lie from hell. Focus on the facts. Focus that you've already won as Christians. We've already won. Right? It's the Super Bowl of our Super Bowls. We've already won. 
So focus on that. Let me just share with you the costs that you will reap rewards later on. Luke chapter 9, verse 22. This is one of my favorite passages. I know I always say that, my favorite passages. <coughs> it says here, verse 22, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and raised up on the third day. Think about that. Circle that third day. That's when things change. We focus on the second day, the first day, where it is really hard. There's grief. There's, there's, uh, there's disunity, right? There's discouragement. But on the third day, he will rise. Verse 23, he was saying this to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. So whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake, the one he will be saved. So my question for you, are you denying yourself? Are you denying yourself? Number two, are you taking up your cross daily? I'm not talking about weekly. I'm not talking about every other day. Are you taking up your cross daily and are you following him? If you want to win, there's the blueprint of it all. Deny yourself. We live in a very selfish community, sorry, uh, society that we live in. It's all about me. It's about making me happy. Where it's not about that. That's a lie. It's about the holiness of God. The holiness of God. Let me close by saying this, the greatest sacrifice, as you guys know, the greatest test is Christ. That God gave his very, very best, his only son, to die on our behalf. And we're going to be sharing, I'm going to be sharing that this, um, this Christmas season, his very best. He did not withhold. He didn't say, no, I'm only going to die for these people. No. For all, all, John 3, 16, that all may be saved. That's how he loves us. Focus on that. The greatest gift, Emmanuel, he will save us from our sins. Let us pray. Father God, we come before you, and we just thank you so much. I thank you for your word. It is always enduring, always challenging. And I pray for this Christmas season for Four weeks left of this year. Lord, help us to run. Help us to not grow discouraged. Help us to not be held back from our selfishness or, our, 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 or what society tells us we are. But Lord, help us to focus on what you tell us. We are sons and daughters of the greatest king, the greatest God ever, that you send your only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die for all of our sins, to save us from eternity. Father, we love you. Thank you so much for your word. In Christ's name we pray.